Okay, so let's move to H135, uh, the ethics bill. So Representative Gannon, welcome. Thank you, Senator White. Um, so H135 one, one is actually one of two, just so people understand for background, is one of two ethics bills that House Government Operations has been working on. Um, this is basically um, a bill with technical corrections that were recommended um, by the Ethics Commission um, with respect um, to its responsibilities. Um, a separate ethics bill that we are, that's still in our committee that deals with the, the ethics code and um, putting it into statute. Um, so that is a, a separate bill that we hope that we will be working on um, in the remainder of the session. So I just want, just for background, I thought that's important. Um, to understand so that there's actually two ethics bills. Um, so I said, uh, most of this is, is um, technical corrections. Um, it deals with um, staggered, staggering the terms of the ethics commission, um, among other things. Um, it allows um, the executive director um, of the state ethics commission <laughs> um, to, pro to provide both verbal um, guidance um, as well as written guidance. Um, and it allows him to consult with respect to that guidance um, with other um, people that may be impacted by it. So for example, if he gets a request for ethics guidance from an agency head and believes that, um, that, that that guidance would be helpful to all agency heads, he can consult with those other agency heads with respect to developing um, his advisory opinion. Um, so I think, you know, those are some of the, the key changes. There's a, a many technical changes, such as changing the name of the Department of Human Resources document that contains um, conflict of interest rules. Um, it was referred to as a code of ethics that does not exist. Um, and there's a change to one of the appointing authorities um, to the State Ethics Commission. Um, so those are very technical changes. Um, one thing I should mention, I know um, the executive director emailed um, at least Senator White about this, is that when the bill went to appropriations, um, the language with respect to allowing the executive director to hire someone um, was removed. Um, there was a lot of confusion about when um, that position would need to be, to be hired. Um, and so just to, to keep things simple, um, that language was removed for this this time. Um, do, remind me here if we made this change before or if this is in here. I don't have the bill right in front of me right now, and I apologize. But because um, I only have one um, implement to, to use right now, um, but. Did we um, already change the um, language around who advisory opinions are given to or who can request them? Yeah. Or is that in here? We changed that last year? I believe we did. No. Okay. Let's see. Oh yeah, no, there's been change. No, there is a change with respect to this. Um, not only can it be existing, um, officers and employees, um, but it can be also prospective officers and employees. So that's a change that's made. Uh, but it makes it clear that it's to the people who are covered by the, by the, co by the ethics who are subject to it that ask for the advisory opinion. So an outside agency or group could not ask for an advisory opinion. Yes. Is that made clear in here? Um, not in, Yes, it is. I, not no. That change was not made in one thirty-five. I think. Okay, it's our, I think. I think, it was. I think if we haven't made that change, we need to make that change because that's what caused the the big flap. No, it's it's been made. And then another significant change um, is changing the disclosure from biannual to annual. Um, oh. You know, because as as the state ethics commission pointed out, um, somebody could you know have income <laughs> in the year that they're not reporting. Um, their income that um, we would want to know about. Um, 
And so by requiring annual disclosure, you can't escape disclosing all your income um, from all different sources. So for example, you could have a source of income that you don't want anybody to know about. So you get it in the year, you don't have to file financial disclosure. Mm -hmm. So this way you can't do that, which I thought was a great catch by the um, executive director. I wish we could do the same thing around the rebates, the tax uh, rebates, so that people who have a lot of unearned income and who um, file for a rebate on one year because their, ta their income is limited. And then next year, um, uh, make all the additions to their houses and um, trade in their cars and buy their new motorcycle um, and then don't report it. I, I mean, they, they do it that year, so then they don't get a rebate and then the next year they get another rebate. So anyway, I wish we could do the same thing with that. But any questions for Representative Gannon? Yes, Senator Colmore. Thank you, Madam Chair. So I, I've got the bill in front of me. I just want to make sure I'm clear on what the uh, Senator from, from Wyndham just asked. The language now reads, the executive director may provide to a person who will be subject to the provisions of this chapter upon his or her request guidance with respect to that person's duties regarding any provision of this chapter or regarding any other issue related to governmental ethics. So I understand what that means, but the chair was correct that this surfaced uh, a, a while back because there was an opinion that had to do with uh, someone that was running for office, I believe. And uh, it, you say that that was struck, uh, Representative again, but was it struck before before this iteration of the bill? I believe that's correct because we took that up, um, I think two years ago um, okay. with respect to an advisory opinion that was issued um, with respect to the governor that was sought by a third party um, right. entity. Um, it, we're, the process that should have been filed is that that third party entity, if they had a problem, they should have filed a complaint. And that the complaint, as you know, are, complaints are confidential. Um, and so I, I believe they're, what they were attempting to do was get around the confidentiality of a complaint versus an advisory opinion. So that's already uh, in, in existing law. I, I am almost positive that's been resolved. Thank you. Yeah, I, I just will just make sure that the language is very clear because I think there was never an intent to allow outside parties to ask for an advisory opinion. Advisory opinion was advice to us. That's what it means, advice to us. And um, I'm not sure that it was an attempt to get around the complaint system, but I think there really was a misunderstanding both, both at the um, level of the of VPIRG, who is the one that asked for the advisory uh, opinion, and from the Ethics Commission itself, because they actually issued one. Um, and so I think that there was misunderstanding about the intent of the legislation. So we'll just make sure that it, it has, that it's very clear so that that doesn't happen again. But I think Sen Representative Gannon is right that we may have cleared that up. I, I will say, Representative Gannon, I'm glad you brought up the, the code of ethics because I, when I saw that we only got the technical changes, I put on our schedule that we're going to start dealing with the code of ethics. But if you're, if you're doing that already, um, then we won't, we won't address that until we get it from you. Yeah. And the reasoning behind having two separate bills was um, th this is for the most part technical changes, which mm -hmm. we, we don't think anyone is going to object to. Um, the code of ethics may be another issue altogether. And so keeping them separate would not mm -hmm. have held up um, these important changes. No, I appreciate that. I just I'm glad you said that you were going to be working on that because I had already put on our schedule for next week that we were going to start dealing with it. But I don't think there's any point, uh, committee, do you think there's any point to doing it until as long as they're doing it, then we'll get it. Sure. Okay. All right. I have a quick question. Sure. 
in terms of the advisory opinions, it says at the bottom of page 11, but we're sorry, that you provide it to a person who is or will be subject to the provisions of this chapter. Does that mean somebody who might be about to take a job and so they want to, they're, they're seeking an opinion about something before they take the job? Is that what that's meant to be? That's my understanding. Okay, that's what I thought. I just wanted to be clear. If, if you're going to take a job and you want to be sure whether your consulting company would be a conflict of interest somehow or against the, the ethics of the state, um, or if you're going to run for office and you find that you have to give up your job or would this be a conflict or something? Yeah. I think that's what it means. Okay. I would guess. Okay. Any more questions for Representative Gannon? All right. We'll let you go back to your busy floor schedule. Thank you. Thank you. Do you see the picture behind him? Did it, did you guys see the picture behind him there? He was, um, he, he raises turkeys. And his, the bear got into his turkey feed, into the feed bags, and um, it scattered the turkeys all over the place. It, the bear didn't eat the turkeys, but ate the feed. And so the only way he could get the turkeys back in the pen was to put the bag of feed over his shoulder, and they followed him. That's what that picture is. Anyway. It's been his picture, actually, for a while now. Yeah, he has one of the turkeys in the summer too. So, um, um, Larry Novins, do you want to join us? And I would love to. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon. It's nice to see you all again. It's good to see you too. <laughs> On a day that feels like spring. <laughs> Getting there. Yeah, really. Um, Representative Gannon brought up a couple things that I'd like to address, and, and just for your. Um, memories last year, H634 um, had essentially everything that was in this bill, H135. Um, but because of COVID, it didn't go anywhere. Um, so the provisions uh, about uh, limiting who can ask for advisory opinions or guidance were not in the law. Um, they are in this bill. And the idea behind it is to uh, make very clear that advisory opinions and guidance are not available to people outside of state government. Um, and that they are limited to people who are asking about their own affairs. So I could not ask, you know, is Jim Condos doing something unethical? I could ask, is what I'm planning to do uh, a problem or not? Um, but we, we, what we want to avoid is what happened with that advisory opinion <laughs> that is being in a position to play gotcha and issuing um, statements about people who aren't involved in the process. It, the idea is to be a resource for people in state government, <clears throat> excuse me, and to be able to be responsive to them when they have questions about their own conduct. So if I had, Gesundheit, if I had a question about someone else's conduct and I called the Ethics Commission, the answer would be, sorry, I can't address your concern with someone else. If you'd like to ask them to call me, call the Ethics Commission, they'll be happy to hear from you. So that's what we, we did in this bill. That's what we asked for last year. <laughs> About a year and a half ago, we adopted this as our policy, and that has been our policy ever since, but it is not, doesn't have the force of law. It is just an internal um, ethics commission policy. <clears throat> but that's a big change, and it's a very important change for all the reasons that uh, the chair outlined a moment ago, or a few moments ago. Um, but Larry, Larry yes, sir. that's... That's in this bill, you're saying? It is in this bill, yes. I just don't see it. I'm not saying it's not there, but I'm, I've been flipping um, through the pages. In 1225? Say that again, I'm sorry. In section 1225, which is on page 26 of the bill as it was passed, the official version. Um, the no, I'm looking director, at, mine only goes up to page 15. Yeah, that's all we have is page 15. OK, well, let me look back. Um, the bottom of page 11 is where Section 1225 starts. Let me go back up to page 11. Thank you, Amarin. <clears throat> 24, yeah. Okay, so it says the executive director may provide to a person who is or will be subject to the provisions of this chapter upon his or her request guidance with respect to that person's duties. I guess the question is, is it necessary to put in there that 
it doesn't it doesn't ever it's just silent on the requests from other people and is it necessary to put in here that advisory opinions or whatever they're called are not available to persons who are not covered by I, I think that being proactive and actually saying that would be yeah well wise. the section excuse me oh the section on advisory opinions which is on again on page um 13, um, section B, it says, on the request of a person who is or will be subject to the provisions of these, this chapter, the executive director may issue an advisory opinion to that person that provides general advice or interpretation with respect to that person's duties. So it's, I think it's very clear. Um, I, I agree with you that that's very clear, but it doesn't proactively say you can't give an opinion to anybody else. It, I, I think that even if you put in the a word only, may right. issue an advisory opinion only to. That would be fine. I have no problem with that. Is that what you were driving at, Senator Polina? Yes. Because we, correct me if I'm wrong about this, but with the VPIRG example, if VPIRG really had a problem with what was going on, they could have like filed a complaint or something, right? They, they not through the ethics commission, but they, there's stuff they could have done if they wanted to raise that issue. We got not going, not asking for an advisory opinion. What well, the time they they acted and requested the intercession of the ethics commission, there was no code. And there was nothing really at that point for the ethics commission to opine about. <clears throat> so was there anywhere for VPIRC to turn though in that case? No, I mean, okay. except to uh, the electorate, but. Right, right. okay, thank you. Well, I, and I think that um, there, was a, there was a real misunderstanding about the advisory opinions and the misunderstanding sure. also admit, um, existed on the ethics commission itself, because they ended up giving an advisory opinion to VPIRG. And the, so I think, it's, I think it's really important to make it clear in here that the advisory opinions are only meant for those who are covered. I agree. That was our intent. And that's, that was the, the issue that really compelled the drafting of this section. Right. It was to make it clear to the outside world, we've told everybody, and it's in our policy. If you want us to give you an opinion about somebody else's conduct, we're not going to do it. Um, but we wanted it to be in the statute to make it clear. So if you want to add the word only to make something that is clear, abundantly clear, great. You know, we have no problem with that whatsoever. I, I would I would like to do that. I don't know about other committee members because I want to avoid this argument again. Senator Collimore. Thank you, Madam Chair. I agree. And Larry, in the sense it is belts and suspenders, but um, I agree with the chair. And I think it appears in more than one sentence. We're looking it appears at- in two places. It appears in the um, section on guidance. Correct. It appears on the section um, on advisory opinions, both mm -hmm. sections. So I would suggest that we put the word only in both places. Well, guidance, isn't guidance a little bit different? Isn't guidance, if you have um, three requests for an advisory opinion on a certain issue and you think, oh, th this might be something that's kind of generally misunderstood, you can issue a guidance. So it isn't just about their my own conduct, but you can issue a guidance, a general guidance that says, um, you know, if you're thinking about getting a second job, you might want to make sure that it isn't in conflict with your first job or something like that. It's a general guidance as opposed to specifically aimed at an individual's actions. I think it should be very clear that advisory opinions are not aimed at individuals at all. They are to be general. And so the advisory opinion that the Ethics Commission issued, which related to one person, would not under this um, scenario be issued. That is not a proper subject for a, an advisory opinion. 
if we had, um, you know, if we had received several questions uh, from people in state government saying, what about my second job? How does this line up with my duties as a state public servant? Then maybe that would be something that would be appropriate um, for an advisory opinion. And what we put in this bill is uh, when, if, and when we engage in that kind of activity and are going to issue something that would be of general impact to many people, that we would be able to open it up and ask for um, public input. Basically, it's, it's sort of like rulemaking. You know, if we're going to offer an opine about the propriety of people with second jobs, I want to hear not only from the person who has the question regarding their job, but other people in state government who may have the same issue, who are unaware that the issue is being raised with us. Um, I think the more input we have before we issue an advisory opinion, um, the better we'll be. It makes the whole process more open, more transparent. And so it gives us a record. <clears throat> I'm, I've gotten myself all wrapped around something here. But I, I thought you just said you don't issue an advisory opinion to a person. Uh, to a person else, okay. I, I thought that I thought that the way, and I, maybe I've completely misremembered this, that I call you and say, um, "Do you think this would be a violation? Yes. What, whatever it is," and you give me some advice. You say you give an advisory to me that this is. You give me advice. This is what we think. This is. So you might want to think about this, you might want to think about that, but you're giving me some advice. Then um, if, so I thought that was what an advisory opinion was. It was issued to me about that issue that I called you about. And then when, if seven people call you about the exact same issue that you at some point you say, whoa, this might be a general misunderstanding by lots of people. Maybe we should issue uh, some guidance on this particular issue. That's the way I understood the difference between an advisory opinion and guidance. Yes, I, I, I feel the same. I, I agree with you. That's sort of how I would yeah, I, the language in the statute is a little misleading and, and it's somewhat problematic. Um, when somebody calls and asks me, what should I do? That under this statute is called guidance. An advisory opinion is a formal opinion that is issued for general circulation regarding any number of people and, and something that would come up in state government capable of repetition um, that should be addressed. But when I get a telephone call or a letter and somebody says, Larry, I've got this problem, I've got this conflict of interest, something like that, that falls under the category of guidance. And oh, so I had it backwards. Is guidance, yeah. Oh, so I had so, it backwards. Well, I mean, it, it, the language, the, the choice of words is a little confusing because when I issue guidance, I'm advising somebody and that's where yeah. the confusion comes. Um, Maybe we should change the language. Um, I can explain it to people when they call. I'm happy to do that. Okay. I just want to make it clear that it isn't um, that the, then, then the guidance is also only to us. And, and it's very clear yeah. in our amendments that the guidance I think is personal. That's what um, was proposed. Okay, good. Okay, thank you. Okay. Senator Perlina, you're muted. I understand that the guidance is directed at a person. Then there's the advisory opinions. I, I'm just my question is whether any of these. I know that I know the guidance is never released to the public. Is there any time when a guide when an advisory opinion or something would be released in general, or would it just be released to the people on the sort of on the inside, the ones who it might affect? If we release an advisory opinion, it is a public document. It is available okay. to everyone. Thanks. And in fact, the guidance, if I'm reading correctly, is exempt from the public records. Act. Correct. It's confidential. Okay. I get it now. So we only need one only. I'm sorry? We only need one only. Since, since guidance by its definition involves a sole person, right. um, I think the advisory opinion is the only one that we should probably further clarify by saying only. 
Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I think you're right. Any other questions or? I, I had a couple of other things if, if, sure. you, if you have a moment. Well, um, we do. It's yours. <clears throat> Great. Um, what I, two things that came up. Um, one is in section 1211 on the annual reports. I mean, the, uh, the annual disclosure forms. Um, and we're ch changing it right now. It says biennial. We're changing it to annual, which makes sense. And Representative Gannon explained why that is. When people fill out those forms, though, and this is a problem that came up in January, people filled out the forms and for the income for the preceding year, um, they left blank. And I couldn't figure out what was going on with the form. People were misreading the form. The statute asks people to give their financial information regarding the previous calendar year. And so most people, they fill out the form in January and the previous calendar year is very simple. It's the year before. Um, but the statute also says that if you're appointed or you begin your position, say in November, then you have to fill out the disclosure form for the previous calendar year. So if I was appointed in November uh, or I you know, if I'm appointed this coming November to a job, I would fill out a form and I would disclose my 2020 income, which is now almost a year old. So what we were hoping we could do is to ask you if you would make an amendment to change previous calendar year to previous 12 months. That would just make it very clear that if no matter when I fill out the form, I'm filling out the form for the preceding 12 months. And this is for the uh, commissioners, right? This is for anyone who fills out an executive officer disclosure. Executive for the officer. Commissioners. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and it, it, you know, every 99% of the people are doing it correctly now. Um, but it, if somebody is appointed to a position mid year, then we end up with stale information. So um, I, it, I, to me, it makes perfect sense. But I often think things make perfect sense and other people look at it otherwise. So. <laughs> But I, I have a hard time imagining people are going to have a big problem with that. Um, yeah. It's just, it, it, to my mind, it's clarifying. Um, Committee? Yeah. OK. All right. Are there other issues that you want in uh, here? Well, the other is the one I wrote about this morning. And that is the, um, the issue of, should we be able to hire um, part-time administrative staff? And, you know, and I, I will admit that I have not even seen my email really today, except around a potential okay. amendment. So um, the bill went through. Um, well, you know, as you know, we proposed this bill last year, the end of 2019, and it became H um, 634 last year. And then it went on COVID pause and then was reintroduced this year. So we asked almost a year and a half ago if we could have some administrative assistance um, so that I am not the only person doing everything that happens in the, the ethics commission. And what I attached to my email uh, to you was a page from our annual report outlining the different things that as executive director, I have to do every, every week or every month or whenever it comes up. And there's just a long list of things like maintaining the website, um, getting in all the disclosure forms, creating the page that they go on, loading them up. Um, and this year, I think there were about 80 forms and putting each form on the web is like a 13 step process. Um, and you know, I will admit law school didn't train me for this and it isn't my first choice of things to do, um, but I think there are probably better ways that I could use my time than doing some of those things. Um, so it's, it's on the, the document I gave you um, I think my position is or will be unsustainable um, if I have to spend a significant portion of my time doing all these other things. And I will tell you right now that if I'd known when I joined the Ethics Commission that I was going to be responsible for all these other things, I wouldn't have taken the job. And I was under a misapprehension uh, when I started about whose responsibility that would that would be. If I were to ever leave, um, I don't know anybody in their right mind who would take this job. 
with all the, you know, just the administrative responsibilities. Um, you know, if it, this, it's too bad that um, we're doing this remotely. I have a great story I could tell, you know, after hours about the three weeks it took me to get a printer oh. um, so that I could work from home after I was told after 11 months that I wasn't allowed to use a state printer anymore. Um, that's the kind of little stuff that just eats up inordinate, inordinate amounts of time. Um, and uh, if there was any way that we could uh, have a part-time assistant, that would be very helpful. And I suggested some language in my email to you. And I apologize, I don't believe I CC uh, Amarin on this. I did CC um, John Gannon, um, but I didn't CC Amarin. I can send her a copy of what I sent you, but um, that would be a big, a big deal for us um, and can, a big help. Can you explain what happened in, because Representative Gannon just alluded to some, it going to a probes and they taking it out because there was misunderstanding. And and before that, before you do that, uh, I saw that Senator Collimore had his hand up. Well, it's germane, but I'd certainly be willing to listen to uh, Mr. Nobins answer. I read his email and I'm, I'm just trying to get a sense of the dollar amount your, you said your budget for uh, 2022 is 113,000, I think. You're right. looking for a half time. So does that mean if, that you're looking for somebody for about $56,000? With, with salary and benefits and getting them a computer and a phone would be about, I was told to ask for $60,000. Okay, thank you. Yeah. So That's now to the chair's question, why was it taken out? What was the misunderstanding? I don't yeah. know. The only thing I have is what I got in an email from John Gannon, which I quoted to you um, in my email this morning. And that is, um, uh, let me see if I can find it here, uh, that they felt the language that was in the, in the preceding draft was too vague and that the decision could be put off since additional staff was tied to the passage of the Code of Ethics. And I have to say, I didn't know this hearing was going on and I wasn't asked to attend. Um, so I was not able to speak up and uh, defend that part of our proposal, which had been approved by the um, House Government Operations Committee. So I was, it was a surprise to me when I was preparing for today and decided to just to read through the bill um, that I noticed that was missing. And then I wrote to uh, Representative Gannon and he, that's what he told me. So it was a surprise and a bit of a shock after asking uh, what, 14, 15 months ago for this, uh, for it to be all of a sudden yanked without um, having had an opportunity to be heard on that. So the other thing is we do have some money. Um, apparently in the first year, um, there was about 50 or $60,000 left over that's in a reserve fund. And I have to say this is a little over my pay grade, but this is what I'm told. But we were told that if we got permission to have a part-time slot, it would not require us to make a budget request for FY 2020. So, so you need is we could do it without an appropriation for this next year. You need permission to have to get the position, yeah, but not the, the appropriation. Correct. And then, um, but your you asked for this um, 14 months ago. So it is not tied to the implementation of the code of ethics. Not in my mind, no, yeah. <laughs> not at all. And I don't know where that came from. I mean, the day-to-day -day operation of the ethics commission uh, requires a lot of administrative work. And mm -hmm. if I could have help for it, I could dedicate more of my time to things that are uniquely within my, my skill set. Um, yeah. You know, one of the things I'd like to do is more reach out and more education, ethics education. Um, I'm going to be doing a training for one department in a couple of weeks, and I hope to be able to, to offer it to more departments and to get out and, and reach out to more people. And if I'm loading um, disclosure reports onto the internet, uh, it's not the best use of my, of, I think, our taxpayer dollars. So, um, Senator Clarkson? I, I think that makes a lot of sense, Larry. I, I guess I'm also concerned in, in your email after you say the you know the line you propose is the executive director is authorized to employ a half-time administrative assistant. 
it, the next sentence says a code of ethics will not be passed this year. I don't see how it can be passed this year because we've already passed crossover. It won't be. The, the House committee is still working on it. Well, the, it was only introduced on March 9th. Right. Wow. So nobody's even had a hearing on it yet. It right. is, not, there's, I don't know. I mean, it, I would love if there was a way it could be passed this year, but it's not in my understanding well, how it, things it, work. As you know, magic can happen uh, if, mm -hmm. if testimony is taken and if people agree to attach it to something uh, that's at, at, uh, uh, applicable, these things can happen. So um, anyway, okay, so that's why you, right. Okay. Yeah, I mean, I'm, but, I stand um, ready to be amazed. Right. I, I would not yeah. stand ready if I were you because I think the passage of a state code of ethics is going to be Take, is going to take a lot of testimony from a lot of different people. And I don't think it's a slam dunk and it will, has to go through the house and through us. So I, there is no way this is going to happen by middle of May. So the second part of my question is you refer to the American rescue plan as having money in it for this work. Uh, is that right? help us understand the intersection between what we may be seeing with the American yep. Rescue Plan and your office. I received an email the end of February saying, hey, we may be getting some money. Do you have a wish list? Essentially is what it was. And I went, great. I'll tell them that we've asked for a position in H-135 and we've got funding for it, but if, uh, if there's a way to make an appropriation for it, great, we'd be happy to have it. It was more of a wish than anything else, but it, it seemed ill-advised to let that opportunity go by without saying anything. So that's what we did. And that the only reason I reference that is to show that the state, uh, you know, if we're talking about $60,000, I don't think that's the issue. The issue is, well, I'm, I, I don't really understand what the issue is, but um, in the grand scheme of things, the $60,000 is not going to adversely affect the state budget if we're getting in, what is it, $1.3 billion for different things. Um, I, you know, I remember last year, everybody thinking we are in dire straits and it's going to be a horrible year. And we're, I think everybody is equally uh, pleased that it hasn't turned out that way. Uh, and if I may ask, who who let you know that there might be money that could be channeled towards the ethics commission? Um, let's see. Uh, the email went from Adam Gresham okay, to so all the agency of administration people and the people who do our budget work sent it to me. So that's how I heard about it. Um, okay. Terrific. Well, I think that we can easily put in the request for a, a halftime position. Yeah. And then um, the appropriations committee can figure out whether it should come from where it would come from. But in the, the bottom line is that if it's in a reserve fund, it can come from there if it can't come from someplace else. I agree. Does that make sense? Okay. All right. Anything else for Larry? So, Amron, you got are adding the word only and requesting a position. I also have the 12 month period versus calendar year. Great. Is that? Okay, um, and for the position, is this, where did we land on whether there needs to be an appropriation for this next fiscal year? I don't think there needs to be because if it's in the, if it's in the reserve fund, appropriations will take it from there. If it's, it, it, unless they take it from someplace else and leave that in the reserve fund. But I don't think, we'll leave that up to the appropriations committee. But they'll they'll have us come in anyway and right tell them where what uh, where to take it from or we could put in that um, a request for sixty thousand yep. dollars I would to fund it, it and, and then pull it out yeah uh, let's put it in and then appropriations um, 
because then it will go to appropriations and um, and then they can figure out where best to take it from. Okay. But may I just clarify, uh, Madam Chair? Uh, Larry, your position is still not full-time. Correct. Should it be? Yeah. I mean, if, if we're asking, and, and if Adam Gresham feels that there is uh, money for this and, and it will be over a certain number of years, I mean, I'm, I'm, I, again, I'm not, we're not fully clear on everything in the American Rescue Plan for states and administration, but um, I, I think this would be the time for us to actually think about that if you feel it, it actually deserve, needs to be, particularly if we're doing the code of ethics or do we, after we uh, pass a code of ethics, is that the moment to, to make it full time? I, I think that the work leading up to that code of ethics is gonna take a lot of your time and a lot more time than you have now. Yeah, um, I mean, I spent the better part of last summer and last fall putting this draft together mm -hmm. and it's now, you know, mostly in your hands and uh, whatever assistance I can provide during the process, I will provide. But I, I don't see that I can't do that in my in my current um, half time position once it, it when and if it's passed. And then we start talking about uh, what happens next. Then at that point, we might consider making it a full time job. I don't think it's essential to do that right now. Okay. I mean, if I were full time and I had no staff, I'd spend part of my time doing administrative work which as you can tell, I'm trying to avoid. <laughs> well, I think it makes more sense to ask for an administrative position now. And then when the, and, and I, I think that Adam Gresham was not necessarily saying this money is here for the ethics commission. He sent it to, my understanding from Larry is he sent it to everybody yeah. saying, yeah. if you have requests. Yeah. No, I, so, I, I, I didn't feel I'd been singled out for largesse. <laughs> yeah. Too bad, huh? Yeah. Any other questions for Larry? Yes. Uh, no, I, I just said, are there any other questions for Larry? So um, I'm both a little disappointed and relieved that House GovOps is actually taking up the draft of the Code of Ethics. Um, relieved because we have enough to do but disappointed because it would have been fun to take the first stab at it. But if they're doing that, um, we'll leave it to them, I think. And I look forward to speaking with them. So maybe what we should do is we'll have um, Amron get us a, a copy of this and then I, I think we're just ready to pass this out. Am I right committee? Do we need more? More testimony on this from any place? Really technical changes. Nope, I'm ha happy with it with those changes. Senator yep. Rahm? Yep. Senator Polina? Yes. Senator Palmer? Yep. Okay. So let's <laughs> do that. And then um, one day next week, we'll just vote it out. Okay. Okay. <coughs> okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. We'll Here's let you know work. when we put it on the agenda so that you can come and make sure that we do what we're supposed to do. Okay, I'll stay in touch with Amarin and yeah. I'm sure we'll, she will Thanks. have it perfect the first time, but <laughs> thank you very much. Thank, thank you. you. Thanks. Well, committee, I did not schedule anything more for today um, because I didn't know how long this would all take. So I don't know if um, anybody has any turtles they need to feed. I don't know the turtle. Well, it's a little early for my turtle, but you know, it, not saying I wouldn't, it doesn't deserve it. <laughs> yes, Gail. Madam Chair, do we need to take a vote on the amendment for S15? Oh, I don't, we don't need to take an official vote. Oh, okay. I don't, I don't think we do, do we committee? No, uh, I, I think the chair will, uh, or the president will ask whether a third reading, and then you could just indicate that the committee met and 
consider it a friendly it. amendment. Yeah. Yeah, okay. unanimously approved it. I don't. What, what, what did you decide? I guess that was when oh, my. You didn't vote. Yeah, you didn't get to vote because you won. Oh, yes. Can I... oh, we're not going to tell you, Senator Clarkson. No, it's a secret. Oh, okay. It's a secret. Besides, um, it's like 30 pages, Allison. Being... So go read it. Amen. No, it it is uh, simply asks for a report from the Secretary of State by January 30th, 2023, which they said is very doable for them because they already know the answers to most of the questions. A report on the impact, the issues related to um, mail out for primaries and municipal elections and the impact on um, th those individuals and communities who have been um, uh, disenfranchised and for whom voting has been an issue. I don't remember exactly how that's worded, but it's whatever was in the original thing. It's on our web page now, Alison. Good. And so we it was, did you do an official vote? No, we didn't. Okay. I don't know that we need to. Okay. So but do we need to? I mean we can. We're supportive of it. Yeah. Yes. We do support it. Yep. And the Secretary of State supported it. And Senator Parent was very gracious in um continuing to come down from where he started. Okay. Well, the big, I think we all appreciate it. It's, a, it's, it, it's, com, it's more complex than perhaps we think of at first blush. Yeah. All right. So committee, is there anything else we need to do? Or do you want an early day off from school? I have a meeting to go to. I know, and Brian has a, a game to go referee. High school playoffs. How exciting. Where are they? I'm at Burn Burton.